My name is Shiraz Haji, and I run a firm called the Clean Tech Group. Um, we provide data and, and services around 18 primary sectors, energy, water, waste are a big theme, really just covering innovation. So we'd love to talk with you about that. But we've got about 30 minutes and six or so of us up here. Um, so we'll go quickly to hear some, some pretty awesome stories. Um, I'm going to actually start with Kevin. Kevin started a kick-ass company, Serious Materials. He's now doing some really interesting things on the app side. But I'd love for you to start us off with a quick story of Sirius for, for the crowd. Oh, uh, where would you like me to start? So Sirius, uh, Sirius Materials uh, became uh, Sirius Energy, uh, renamed uh, several years ago, founded the company and uh, ran it for uh, about nine and a half years. Uh, Sirius was best known for major, major projects, energy uh, efficiency, Empire State Building, New York Stock Exchange, completed about 70,000 projects or so, 420 people, uh, six plants, very successful company. Uh, unfortunately, like uh, many companies in the, uh, in the private space, uh, our particular uh, private investors uh, decided that uh, uh, clean tech wasn't a space that they wanted to continue to be in. And, uh, and that company has uh, continued to be sold off uh, sort of pieces and parts. Um, there's lots of stories of this. There's uh, probably a thousand stories out there, <laughs> out there like that. Uh, but, but I think, um, you know, there's a lot of learning uh, um, from this is that uh, the value we delivered to building owners had to be absolutely crisp and clear that they had to have a one, two, possibly at a stretch, a three-year payback. Empire State Building was a three-year payback on the entire project. We retrofitted uh, 6,514 windows, about 26,000 panes of glass, built a factory on the fifth floor to do so. We reused all the old glass. There, uh, there used to be dual pane windows in there, by the way. We took out the dual pane and we made them 400% uh, better uh, than they were from an R2 to an R8. And the payback was under three years. So it was a great, great, great study on, on doing a, an absolutely massive project. And for those who really like Cradle to Cradle, we were able to take the glass out you know, clean it all and reuse it in brand new windows rather than throw it all to the, to the curb down, uh, down there. So uh, um, we had a software division uh, that did uh, a number of things, including uh, really advanced building energy management. That's also been, been sold off to uh, another large player, not, uh, not announced. Uh, so there, there's a little bit of the, the, the overview of uh, Sirius to date. And this was a serious, pardon the pun, business growing at... 60 plus percent at year, okay. some years, 50 plus million in revenue, but now you're off doing things in the app line. Maybe a short of, 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 of what are you up to now, and then we'll keep, keep moving. I, I'm still on a, on a few clean tech boards, and I, I, and I, love, uh, I love the space. Uh, I will tell you, and I used to be a software guy, so I'm, 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 I'm uh, uh, running a company called AppVance that, uh, um, that uh, validates app performance uh, before and after launch. So, you know, everyone thinks their app is going to go to a million users or 50,000 concurrent or whatever. We'll tell you if it really can. And sitting here, I can tell you it, it can't. Uh, <laughs> and we'll show you where the problems are. So it's, it's a good business. But, but there's nothing like the impact we can have, IT or otherwise, on the world when you're impacting energy. And uh, I think that's a great segue uh, to the other people up here. Yeah, so Kevin's kind of moving a little bit away from energy management. Tom, you're diving uh, right in. What's, uh, what, what, what are you up to and how's it going? Yeah, so the firm uh, we're working on now is Gridium. We're about 18 months in. Uh, we certainly, we started when uh, things were sort of uh, going sideways uh, for you from a capital perspective at, at Sirius. We knew we had to rethink the model. Um, and uh, we did two things. Number one, we just focus on available data, and for us that means smart meter data. Um, so there's this new data layer out there, nobody is analyzing it, um, nobody is uh, telling the owner of this hotel what that meter data means uh, for him and how he can lower spend. So we take that, uh, we've hit a radically low price point, so we sell this for $79 a, a meter a month. Uh, which is uh, about a tenth of, uh, of the going rate from other solutions, and that's led to very fast growth. So we've gone from zero uh, square footage uh, 18 months ago to over 100 million square feet um, today. Yeah. Um, and that's just in, in California. So uh, in many ways, um, uh, I think we all would recognize that energy efficiency is a huge potential, but it's a very uh, diff difficult structural market. Yeah, you've got lo lots of... Uh, mixed incentives, you got very short-term uh, decision-making. You mentioned one-year uh, payback. Uh, I, I think for software, you know, you got to have a payback of a month, uh, otherwise people just won't adopt it. Uh, and that's, that's why we try to hit, you know, sort of 
mind-opening, uh, no-brainer paybacks, and, and that's what's led to, our, led to our growth. Yeah. Ray, care to help me ask him some really hard questions right now? You're a long-time venture capitalist. <laughs> I'll invite you to do so. Otherwise, I'll, I'll try my best. So. Ask some hard questions? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Uh, going public, uh, that seems to be what a lot of people need to do. A, it provides capital for expansion. It provides credibility. You know, Solar City and Tesla and a few others recently have shown that it is possible. Uh, just on that point, last year we asked the question last summer, what has all the venture industry done yeah. in terms of energy investing? And we went and scraped all the websites that we could find. We found 460 deals out there. There was only 27 had gone public this is as of last summer, and only one was in the, was in the green. Yeah. Uh, all the rest were, were down and dirty and, and in trouble. So exits have been real challenging. Really, really challenging. And that, you know, that's, that just ripples right up the stream to the, to the grumpy LPs that we all have uh, who started asking for a lot of their money back pretty quickly after 2008. <laughs> so it's been a, it's been a very, um, it's like driving a car going 100 miles an hour and then slamming on the brakes and your head sort of bounces off the <laughs> dashboard and you go again and bam, it's sort of the LP. So yeah. there's been this sort of accordion effect in the whole money chain. Yeah. Uh, but I would say this, it's, it's great, efficiency is hard, because you can't save yourself to prosperity. Right. You can save yourself to a point, but yep. then you need energy. Yep. And that's really the big market for the 21st yeah. century. Yeah. Awesome comment. I, I'm, I'm gonna, I was hoping you'd actually really drill Tom with a hard question about his business. I'm gonna try my best. <laughs> <here. laughs> so Tom, you were trying to sell directly to buildings at like 70, I mean, are you crazy? How on earth no. could that sales and marketing model work? <clears throat> are you insane? Yes, uh, we are crazy. Um, <laughs> Look, I mean, I, I think for, for many people, you got to get something started. And uh, we just recently won our first utility deal, um, which is a sort of unthinkable for a company that's 18 months old. Uh, and the, the reason we won it is we brought 100 million square feet to the table. Uh, and yes, there was a lot of phone calls and uh, several pairs of shoes pounding the street, uh, but, but we got it done. And How many it, customers is 100 million square feet? 100 million square feet is about, uh, we've got about 500 uh, okay. customers. Um, Can I get that list? <laughs> <laughs> see me afterwards. Um, uh, and, you know, I think the utilities are, uh, the utilities have a business interest in, in, in seeing energy reductions. And look, the, none of this is, none right. of this is right. the rap, is the massive reductions that you would uh, achieve through your system. Uh, you know, these are simple things. It's like, look, turn the building off at night. Don't start the building at one in the morning. Uh, be careful about how you manage your peak demand. Uh, but those savings are in the three to 5% range and they're very interesting to utilities because they're very cheap to accomplish. Yeah. Uh, and so, yes, we're starting with direct sales, but our hope is that, you know, we can get other people in the ecosystem interested in Good. easy to use, simple software, and yeah. we can use that as a platform for yeah. growth. So we're going to stay on the demand side, and, I, you know, plug load and is, is a big part of what, what, we're, uh, <laughs> what we spend our energy on. So, Michael, maybe g g catch us up on what you're sure. doing and um, how it impacts the... I want to replicate their growth. All right, uh, cool. IPO, <laughs> so you're happy and my <laughs> LPs are happy, um, which means you're investing after this. You're accredited. We know that's, so that's great. Um, IBIS is, you know, we're based out of Hawaii. Uh, and when I was a VC, I always said that's a really um, dangerous place to base yourself and then say, I'm going to go to the mainland. Um, but utility, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> utility rates are 32 to 42 cents a kilowatt, um, which is yeah. absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and so we can move the needle very quickly with a small number of sockets. Uh, so we're doing plug load efficiency. Uh, we plug our smart, smart sockets into uh, all the wall sockets that you see in a facility. Uh, they link up to a server. Uh, they start measuring energy use for every device that's plugged into them. And then we can do you know, disambiguated demand response. We can turn things off. Um, I think you said it best. The biggest thing to do is, hey, just turn <coughs> stuff off. Yeah. Uh, and it's very difficult if you have to go around and unplug everything at night. Uh, so having the ability to do that, you know, from your iPhone or from your server for hundreds of devices, uh, I think, is, is where you can start to really move the needle. And are you trying to do this with consumers? Are you trying to do this in office buildings? Well, we, yeah, so we're not focused on the consumer market. There's yeah. a lot of different uh, smart socket solutions out there. Yeah. And I think that's sort of a commodity play. It's going to drive yeah. into the ground. Yeah. We built our system to be uh, scalable for large enterprises yeah. like hotels. Schools yeah. are a big one for us. Military we're working with. Yeah. Uh, government buildings, private enterprise. So I went and looked at a customer trying to deploy plug loads, and it was, it was a disaster. You know, it's like, oh my God, how do we keep track of what's where? How, how do you manage these deployments and the, the ongoing 
maintenance of these things is oh, well, you know the the good news is they're relatively robust yeah. so they don't seem to break very much okay um and if they do you you know we'll send you another one and by amazon we'll drop ship you one overnight you unplug that one and plug it in yeah. uh, they all have a unique identifier so you know on the software side we we know what they all are uh, we're working with three different companies on the sort of on the how do you identify what device is plugged in but right now we have a very easy to use interface where if we plug it in, you know, take a picture, we know what the device is, assign it, you know, it gets assigned to that socket if someone else is doing that. We're just scaling up, so honestly, uh, I don't have, you know, 100 million square feet of, of data. Um, but what's nice about Hawaii is everyone's feeling so much pain that they really want to work with us. Yeah. And so we've done a lot of experimentation. Uh, the parent company, before we spun out in February, has been working on this for five years. Great. So we've been able to really test it and see what works and what doesn't. Great. I think we'll go a little bit closer to the energy supply side going to Stefano. If I got my story straight, you are in the fuel cell world. Maybe, maybe a word on what's happening with fuel cells, what's driving it, and what, what are you guys up to? Yes. Uh, I think that uh, just uh, I, I already mentioned what the uh, electric power system is doing, but essentially we are we try to address in an innovative way, well, let me say, the, the fuel cell business uh, in, uh, uh, with two streams. So the first one is uh, to get uh, a logistic-free, let me say, solution. Means uh, to manage the, we are based on hydrogen base, let me say, fuel cell means uh, we are producing our own hydrogen and uh, we are, let's say, getting, let me say, the, the fuel to, to, to power the fuel cell. And so where do you see the hydrogen coming from? Are, are, are people going to... Separate. It's very expensive, right, to make hydrogen? Yeah, how, exactly. how, how you, yeah. How's that going to work? With our own system, in order to, let me say, differentiate ourselves to the traditional, let me say, fuel cell producer, that, that you need to bring the hydrogen, let me say, on site. And this is something uh, that we believe uh, is going to bring a lot of advantages in terms of cost, uh, but in terms of logistic by itself. And this is something that makes us different. Uh, and, uh, and the big challenge for us was uh, to manage cost down. Yeah. And it's still, uh, let me say, an uh, ongoing process because uh, uh, we know that fuel cell, where we say it's not a new, let me say, solution, yeah. but uh, the big problem was cost and, yeah. uh, and, uh, and efficiency from uh, reliability, but uh, from one side, but reliability has been achieved. Uh, let me say now we have a stable system like uh, our competitor also, but uh, let me say the cost, the uh, driving cost down is uh, the key point, and uh, this is going through, uh, let me say, uh, uh, a different approach, uh, let me say, in terms of uh, system, in terms of simplification, in terms of uh, aggregation and. Uh, to get, uh, not only in terms of scales, of course, scales are helping because, of course, when you have scales, uh, you can cut cost. But, uh, and uh, doing this one, uh, we were uh, deciding also to stay very focused on, uh, because we are, a, we are not anymore a startup, we are more than five years in our history, mm -hmm. and uh, we decided to get uh, into a, a telecom backup market. Uh, that is not the best way to use our technology in a certain way, but uh, was allowing us, so let me say, to start to generate sales. Yes and the status of some cash and to support uh, the R&D that for us is still a big, uh, big issue in order to drive cost down. Yeah, generating cash, good segue to a venture capitalist because I think they like that um, <laughs> kind of stuff. Everybody likes cash. Yeah, we have a, a good mix in terms of shareholding as we have yeah, a good mix. We still have a venture capitalist yeah. with a little bit more long term view. <laughs> yeah. then, uh, then we have some industrial partner and we're, but we're looking of course for yeah. additional funds in order to develop for the business. Yeah. Ray, we're talking about innovation in energy, and your firm has been a, a participant and, and I think a, a, a deliberate participant in the space, and you've got yep. 20, 20 plus years looking at cycles. Can you catch us up on what you see and where we are? The cycle relative to energy? Relative um, to energy and energy investing. I think well, you mentioned the exits, and I'm yeah. curious kind of what's next, or what do you, what, what do you guys see? Well, uh, <coughs> our strategy has been to go after uh, supply side, so electricity and gasoline or gasoline substitutions. Yeah. And that means, uh, I, think, I think a lot of venture guys, not, not energy venture people, but they were IT venture people, thought that you could do energy investing like you did IT investing. Yeah. High margins, skim pricing, and that doesn't work because you're competing with a commodity. Yeah. Right? So, that, so fundamentally the economics are. So the idea is you gotta play the cost game. So our investments have been all about cost, reducing the cost, getting it lower and lower and lower, yeah. uh, both in gasoline and electricity. That's, Point one and two. Second, we don't do anything that's subsidized because the government can change its mind. Ours does all the time. If it ever had a mind, uh, it changes a lot. So you can't depend on it. Yeah. So we've avoided those kinds of deals. And therefore, you're into some science and some long-term projects. So the cycle uh, depends upon your LP base, right? Uh, there was a time in the, in the venture business when the LPs uh, were not 
in it for today's income, they were in it for a long-term sort of intergenerational, we call it, growth. And, but unfortunately, a lot of the LPs got burned in the first, cent, the first uh, decade of the 2000s, and so they are in to get our money back. Yeah. So unfortunately, that cycle has contracted a lot. Yeah. I see visiting a lot of new LPs coming into the business with this intergenerational idea. There's now a thousand family offices in America. Uh, you know, the Buffets and the Gateses of the world are sort of changing the discussion. So hopefully there will be a class of limited partner in the venture business yeah. who will take a long-term view. And that, I, it, it'll, take, it'll take five years for that to come back maybe. Yeah. Has negativity been too negative and are we going to surprise ourselves? You look at the public market yeah. right now. Yeah. I mean, all the clean tech companies, Solar City, have outperformed. We're, yeah. we're just talking. So Everything's well, outperformed. Look, yeah. I mean, look. <laughs> okay. If you're in the if you're in the Dow in the last two quarters, uh, you've made more than venture capital has in the last decade. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who knows, right? Yeah. Um, so you got to be in it. Not only, I mean, you got to be in it for the money. That's for sure. Yeah. But the money can come in cycles and at times. And yeah. uh, if, you know, how about a one two three? I mean, uh, you're totally wiped out. Yeah. So you know, it was a billion dollars. So yeah. you know, I'd love to comment on this. My uh, my fiance Erica Rogers actually said this about this space. She says, "Why why did we possibly think we could put the you know climate change and a complete redo of the energy infrastructure worldwide on the backs of venture capital? Yeah, it, it, yeah. it doesn't belong there. It belongs on the backs of governments and yeah. very right. large organizations that can be multi generational. That's right. And 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 you know most VCs you know live, they all live on an IRR and they live on LPs that are beating them and right. Right. You know, three, four, five years, if you're not seeing that return, you, you, it's not a space you want to be into. And, and it's an awful big space to put on the backs of people that need yeah. that kind of return. Yeah, well, it's a good segue to, to a big thinker in this space, Michael Schellenberger, who's a writer, <coughs> thought leader. Um, he said Star climate change. Star Pandora's promise, I might say. <laughs> <laughs> he said climate change. And he said governments. Are, are we allowed to talk about climate change again? In this? He, he said not, it. Not I'm in just... the same sentence, but climate and change in the same sentence. Back away slowly. <laughs> Is that a question? It's a question. Is climate, <laughs> is climate change discussed, debated in, in your circles, in government circles? Is it, is it back on the agenda? I don't know, because Obama won a, a second term? It's, or? It's, I mean, on the, in, in a sense, there's always going to be a constituency for climate. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think these guys are talking about, you know, at the, at the end of the day, what matters to nation states and political economies is energy. And the world is going to triple at least, maybe quadruple the amount of energy it consumes over the next century. Um, there is a pattern to energy transitions. I mean, people go from wood to coal, sometimes to hydro. Africa looks like it might go right from wood to gas. Um, and, uh, you know, and we, we're going right now in the United States from coal to gas. And mostly these transitions are positive. People consume a lot more energy. That energy tends to be a lot cleaner. It tends to be related to new uses for that energy. Yeah. Um, so I think the question and that, that's coming up around nuclear and I think for environmentalists is, how do you accelerate those transitions? How do you accelerate this existing process of decarbonization through technology innovation? So that might mean actually helping the Chinese with fracking technologies. That might mean uh, collaborating with the Chinese on next generation nuclear technologies. You know, in the 90s, we all had this idea that we were gonna benevolently give the poor countries our solar and wind. Um, and then the idea was, well, we're gonna have a, where it's a race, a technology race with China. Uh, which is, these were both ideas that we helped to propagate and now are disavowing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and now I think we look at it and we go, this is really about China in particular, but really the developing world, the rise of the rest, developing these new technologies and us bringing a lot of them back yeah. um, in, in, you know, in, towards the middle of the century. So I think, what's, I think there's a growing up of the environmental movement, a growing up of the conversation around climate to appreciating that uh, decarbonization, this, these energy transitions, there's a 200-year process here. Mostly, as you said, it's led by nation states. And really what uh, uh, the private sector can do, what governments can do, what environmentalists can do, is accelerate that process, move to cheap, clean sources of energy much faster. And it, it's interesting to see uh, you know, Ray's evolution on this. I think it, it, it mirrors a lot of what's happened with Bill Gates and Nathan Mervold, where these guys say, look, if you care about the environment and you care about human development, there's one big issue. And that's cheap, clean energy. Yeah. That's it. I mean, with cheap, clean energy, you can get desalinization. Yeah. You can get fertilizer. You get you're never going to run out of food. You solve a huge number of environmental problems 
with cheap clean energy. And that's a pretty big reversal from the way the environmental movement used to look at mm -hmm, this stuff. Mm -hmm. They used to say, how do we reduce how much energy we consume? Yeah. And I think there's a new generation of environmentalists that are saying, how can we increase the amount of cheap clean energy so the world can develop and so we can uh, uh, prevent catastrophic climate change? So, so, so natural gas is cheap in this country, and as you pointed out, there's been a big push. Is that, is that good? Is it's put great. Yeah, I mean, it's great. I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm from Colorado. They're fracking under the school I went to, my elementary school. <laughs> um, you know, there's issues you have to deal with. So that's the first thing you have to say. And there's going to be impacts in any kind of energy uh, production. But I mean, God, you remember a few years ago, we would say, you got to make you know, clean energy cheap. That's the climate strategy. And people would say, well, you're never going to get energy cheaper than coal. That was the conventional wisdom. You'll never get energy cheaper than coal. People would laugh at us. Well, now we've got natural gas that's cheaper. Well, which isn't, it's cleaner than coal, it's still a fossil fuel. We shouldn't, sure. we, we shouldn't forget, yeah. it's, a, it's a stepping stone, yeah. uh, but it's not as clean as many other things that we have, but Absolutely. it's really cheap right now. If it were up to me, I mean, I would love to go to next generation nuclear really quickly. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. next generation nuclear is going to take a few, you know, some years to develop. But the Chinese are moving up much faster than anybody thought. Um, but they have to. A, they don't have the natural gas resources. They really have to. Do well, they something. actually do have a lot of natural gas. Um, they haven't yet developed. It's, it's in right. different formations than ours, so it's a little bit harder to get to. But I think they will get to the gas as well. Um, but I think it's, you know, some of it is just sort of saying it's getting your head screwed on right, which is that I think environmentalists got lost in carbon pricing and cap and trade and a whole set of things that were basically aimed at reducing energy consumption and making energy more expensive. And I think we're, sure. the way things are shaping up now is yeah. how do we make right. cheaper, form, cleaner sources yeah. of energy much cheaper, and how do we make cheap, dirty forms of energy much cleaner? So yeah. you guys yeah. worrying about the demand side are wasting your time, just <laughs> in case no, you're- No, 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 they're I making- guys, <laughs> <laughs> go No, not at all, they're making buildings cheaper. Yeah. They are making their energy yeah. cheaper. Yeah, I think I, the, yeah, the efficiency is a huge, uh, it's just a huge area. That's the death of a million cuts. Yeah. Um, if you look at, you know, MPG efficiency in cars, you change it by, you know, one, one MPG over 500 million cars, you move the needle. Uh, and so I think, it, I mean, you're absolutely right. The, the whole idea of, of more cheap, clean energy but on the efficiency side, there's so much room for improvement. Sure, With absolutely. everything we've heard, uh, you know, Heidi's company, HEVT, the, the right. numbers there are staggering. The number it, of it, electric motors in the world are staggering. If there's so much room for improvement just to pick on buildings, why has it been so hard? It's not been easy. It's a, right? it's a structural problem with buildings. I mean, uh, you know, most of the buildings are multi-tenant. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. They're owned by an absentee uh, owner. Uh, they're managed by a different company. And, and then the lease apportions costs uh, down to the individual square footage basis. So by the time it gets to your little suite, you don't really uh, care that the building runs on Saturday and nobody's in it. Well, you, um, you almost actively want to leave stuff on because you're like, well, I know my neighbors are doing it and I, I do cam, so I just, you know, it's well, not I my think Well, look, but, but you can get there. I mean, we, we t at Sirius, we touched, you know, tens of thousands of buildings and, and, and improved them. And when you look at the big guys, which aren't represented yeah. right now, JCI and Siemens, et cetera, of course, they're in tens, hundreds of thousands of buildings yeah. all the time. So, yeah. so, you know, this building has an energy management system. It's probably doing a terrible job. Uh, they've got all the wrong lighting, the HVAC is wrong, we can go down the list. This building can be improved by 30 or 40 percent without, without a sweat with just some really good IT work. And what, what, what really moves the needle across buildings in your opinion, Kevin? Is it, is it the next generation of companies? Is it regulation? Is it some... I, I actually, I'm not sure it's, it's different technology that we have. I mean, the, the, the plugs that he's working on are outstanding. It's a better generation. It's a little cheaper. But, but this sort of uh, 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 type of uh, plug system has been around for a handful of yeah. years and the kinds of software that you get sort of been around. It's come down in price. Look, you've got a cost of acquiring a customer. Mm -hmm. You've got a cost of getting into what you really need to get into is very large uh, 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 building suite. So, you know, you want CBRE, you want JLL, right, yeah. and you want, you want to get to a thousand buildings at once. Otherwise, the cost of sale, which you pointed up at first, if his cost of sale is $20,000 to get a customer and he only gets $79 a month, that just, that dog doesn't hunt very long. Yeah. So it's really about getting the cost of sale down. If you get the cost of sale down, you are going to save 10, 20, 30, 40% in almost any commercial building you touch, yeah. and, and arguably in homes, which Nest is proving as well. Yeah. You've got to get yeah. the cost of acquisition down. Let me put it in context yeah. a little bit. I mean, one of the reasons that the supply side argument is dangerous is that it ignores the fact that uh, the climate problem is a cumulative problem. It's a bathtub, and that bathtub is 400 ppm right now. 
And, uh, you know, if you dismiss energy efficiency, you just keep on filling up the bathtub. And yes, you fill it up with coal and gas, which is marginally uh, less drops, but it still drops. And <laughs> the bathtub's filling up. So, um, you know, you've got to, you have to deploy multiple solutions, and demand-side management is, has got to be part of the recipe. Yeah. It's, just, it's just free savings. I, I mean, the thing I you want, have to remember is that the only, the only way to push back a little bit is just that economies have become more energy efficient over the last 200 years. Mm -hmm. That's a clear pattern. So what's happened is as we become more energy efficient, we actually consume a lot more energy. Right. So give me, let me give you an example. Let's say you make a Chinese steel factory more energy efficient. Right. What do you think happens? Do you think they reduce the amount of energy they use? No, they produce more steel. And we want to buy uh, bigger fridges or whatever. Yeah. I'm going to take just sorry, a so couple. One, 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 right. This is awesome. I want to take right. one or two questions. But first, Ray, I want you to comment on Kevin's kind of like, hey, why do we put this on VCs? Should be a government and other big folks. What would you want the government to do in the energy space? <laughs> Any, uh, <laughs> oh, boy. Boy, that's a... Uh, we only have two minutes and 47 seconds. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I'd say that, uh, double or triple the R&D budget uh, of the government. Uh, we're not spending nearly enough money, and sequestration is going to kill us. Uh, America is the most innovative civilization ever, and we are starving it. So we've got to increase the R&D. Uh, our university system is fantastic. Uh, we should keep the people here. The immigration thing, you know, is sort of winding its way through, but it's killing us. Um, the, those that I would start there, yeah. and then I would let the entrepreneurs loose, and yeah. I'd get out of their way. Yeah. And you know, we talk about this uh, valley of death and all that. And that's just BS. If it's a great idea, <laughs> and if it's a possible thing to do, it will get financed. Yeah. Uh, Wall Street is amazing. The greed there is just phenomenal. Yeah. And if they think they're going to make money, they will. The money will show up. So I, I don't buy all this subsidization stuff. I, but I would. The government is our sole source of R and D dollars right now. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I'll say you know China uh, strategically said a few, several years ago that LEDs were clearly the next generation of lighting. They put over $5 billion into 50-some-odd yeah. LED companies, of which two or three or four will survive. We didn't do that in this country. They clearly will make lighting for the next century for the world. We won't. Yeah. Right. Uh, and that was a, a specific government investment. And I, I'm not here to say government should or shouldn't invest because we haven't been very good at it. But the American people aren't very good at accepting the fact that 80% of, or 90% will, will go south, right. yeah. where in China they have no choice. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if yeah. they argue, they get shot or something. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, please. <laughs> yes, I, just wanted, I just wanted to add something I haven't heard in this discussion, and that is that it would be nice to know what the real costs are when we are comparing things like the cost of a gallon of gas and the cost of of uh, sustainable energy. If we have the costs wrong, and of course we do because they don't include such minor things as the wars we fight, the cost of the wars we <laughs> fight to gain access to these substances, which we would not have to fight if we were using natural sources. If you have the wrong energy, the answers you get will always be wrong. There's yeah. no way they can be right. Yeah. And so I just would love to see that somehow included in this sort of discussion. Yeah. Who wants to comment on kind of a fully loaded, levelized cost oh. of energy here? Anyone care to take some comments on that? I mean, this is really, at a policy perspective, that's a very difficult thing because actually you heard it in what the gentleman said, is that when you start internalizing these external costs, what is considered an external cost is quite a matter of opinion. And so um, if you, you know, so actually getting any agreement on that is almost impossible. Um, and that's been the overall strategy of the environmental movement has been to say, let's just internalize these external prices, and it hasn't worked. I mean, they've tried it for 20 years. Um, we have no price on carbon in the United States. Europe did it. Their whole system is in a total collapse right now. So I, I have to say, I think when you look at the way that these transitions from dirtier to cleaner sources of energy occur, it's, us it's overwhelmingly in a Schumpeterian fashion. It's through innovation, it's through disruptive new technologies displacing the older ones. T Tom, you've done a lot on carbon. I mean, California's doing something, care to debate him on like, hey, there will be markets for carbon. There's a huge will... carbon market in the United States. It's well, well functioning, it's about $7 billion and it's trapped inside utilities. Um, and it's basically expressed as, you know, getting paid to swap that lighting or upgrade the HVAC system. And it's very well functioning and, and highly regulated and, and delivers huge gains for the American economy. Outside of it, uh, carbon has become this political football. And yes, it's dead. Uh, it's not coming back. Uh, I ran a fun company called TerraPass. Uh, some of you may have bought carbon credits from TerraPass. 
Um, and, uh, you know, that, that is essentially, uh, you know, no longer a part of the solution set. Yeah. Stefano, we are, tend to be quite U.S. focused. We have these discussions. You travel around a lot. Any d dis observations on what we're doing right when it comes to energy in the U.S. and what we're doing wrong? But listen, uh, I think that I want to touch uh, using on the developing country. I think that there is, a, there is an opportunity in the developing country in order to bring uh, uh, alternative, or alternative energy costs down. Uh, because in a developing country, uh, put aside China for a while, but there are many other countries, starting from Indonesia, for instance, that is quite sizable and uh, is going through a very big transformation now. Uh, you start to see a very fast, let me say, a, uh, the possibility really to introduce, let me say, alternative way, let me say, to produce and to manage energy in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a more efficient way. And, uh, and this is going to give us an opportunity and uh, this country can really make a big jump uh, quite quickly versus the, let me say, the Europe and the United States in which we went through a long process, let me say. And they can adopt a new technology quite quickly, of course, uh, and you can create scales and let me say you can put uh, cost down. Means uh, uh, there are opportunities over there and they're quite receptive uh, to the new technology. And uh, I think that uh, I'm quite optimistic that uh, we need to continue to push uh, and uh, to try whatever it is, uh, let me say, commercial solar, wind, uh, uh, storage, uh, efficiencies. Yeah. Uh, also in this kind of country that seems to be uh, driven by cost, uh, by price and so on. And yeah. uh, but uh, there is, uh, let me say, the possibility to do something and uh, I have yeah. a hope uh, that a uh, country like Indonesia, South Africa and uh, India by itself, let me yeah. say, can make a difference. No, well said. So let's just end with each of you saying some, mentioning some, some cool thing you have observed or read about or seen. Um, could be certainly emerging markets leapfrogging, but could be in the US, could be anywhere. Um, I'll kick it off just to give you guys a, a couple seconds to, to, to formulate here. If you guys saw Google uh, bought Makani Power, has anybody seen, uh, anybody heard of Makani Power in here? Yep. yep. A couple of you guys? So yep. it's, a, you, you know, it's, it's a kite that, that does like way up high that does these loops and generates a little bit of electricity as it's doing that. And, you know, I don't think it's quite economic or generating a bunch, but it's, it's a, you know, Google acquired the company um, as a kind of futuristic, try to figure out if this could be a, a, a sustainable way to, to, to generate power, which I thought was way, way cool. So that is mine. Who's up for, uh, for kicking this off? You each get just a few seconds to articulate it. I, I, I'm happy to start. Um, I would say the, the thing that excites me most about what I see every day is once you empower people with information, they can change their behavior. And I, I think that's a really important part, especially with, with kids and, and younger people. And so what we see is we empower you by giving you the information to do something. And, and that, to me, is the most exciting thing about a lot of these technologies. Great. All right, who wants to go next? Please be as specific as possible. What's a cool thing you've seen out well, there? Well, I, I think there's, uh, for everybody in this room, there's great opportunity in this space for low capital intense businesses that are probably IT based. A little bit of hardware, a lot of software. Yeah. Those are the kinds of things that Ray is going to fund. They're still the kind of things that almost anyone's going to do. I think these bigger plays of let's build six factories and, and, and you know, import this and build that. And design, I think yeah. you know, these things that take 100 million to, what, what is it? Um, Bloom raised 1.1 billion now. I think yeah. they hit it at, 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 if I read it right, 2.7 billion free money. Uh, okay, that's a view. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how you get that money back, and I really wish them the best of luck. They're good people, yeah. but I think I think this is a time for for yeah. small cap, less capital intensive. And we need to wrap here, so it's going to be real quick and short. Who's who's got? I say Elon Musk is the coolest thing out there right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's good. He he's amazing, uh, and you yeah. know I can just stop right there. That's awesome. So, yeah. I'll, <laughs> Stefano, Tom, Michael, real I'll, short. I'll second that and say Elon Musk's energy engineer that runs the plant and has uh, dropped base load 80% mm -hmm. uh, since he started yeah. is the second yeah. coolest it's, thing. It's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, cool. Yeah. Really yeah. Good. Stefano? I don't think the tide, the, the energy from tide. I mean, so tide, 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 yeah. I think that is a huge potential. A lot of things have been done, but uh, a lot of things to, to yeah. be focused on. Michael, last word here. I, I think the most exciting thing is what China is doing with advanced nuclear yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and the natural gas revolution. Awesome. Join me in thanking the panelists. They did a good job. Good job. Thanks. Cool.